book of Revelation. It was about this book that Ellen White once said that all the books of the Bible meet and end. Revelation, the tenth chapter, and verses one through six. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. That scripture that we have just listened to is an early Advent scripture, and it has some significance for us today. Time shall be no longer. Its earlier reference was not so much to the fact that the end of the world was right then as it was to the fact that prophetic time had come to its end. And since 1844, the end of the longest prophetic period in Scripture, time is not a factor. In fact, we are warned against setting time. If you look up under the index to the councils for this church, you'll discover that God's people cannot set time for the second coming. There is no more message based on time. Time is not a test since 1844. Time will never be a test again. And when we set time for the close of probation or the coming of Christ or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we are as false prophets. We please Satan and we weaken the faith of God's people. So what's new since... Uh, 1844, that's one of them, that prophetic time is no longer. And time setting is no longer. Well, that was sort of a parenthesis for today. I suppose it's kind of weird to start with a parenthesis. But it's interesting to... Uh, Notice that. Some people think it might be quite relevant for today. We've been studying the Elijah message, and we have noticed that there are three parts to the Elijah message, whether it is Elijah 1, the Tishbite, or Elijah 2, John the Baptist, or Elijah 3, those people at the very end since 1844. The three parts are an appeal to come back to the commandments of God, a warning against following Baal, which is nothing else than self-worship, and calling people's attention to the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Now I'd like to build a bridge for a moment from this essence of the Elijah message 
into what we know familiarly as the three angels' messages, or the third angel's message, a label that covers all of them. In this time of well-nigh universal apostasy, God calls upon his messengers to proclaim his law in the spirit and power of Elias. As John the Baptist, in preparing the people for Christ's first advent, called their attention to the commandments of God, so we are to give with no uncertain sound the message, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. With the earnestness that characterized Elijah the prophet and John the Baptist, we are to strive to prepare the way for Christ's second advent, 4 B.C. 1184. My purpose in calling attention to this is the close connection between John the Baptist, Elijah, and the people of the three angels. I suppose that you are aware that the only thing that is unique for Seventh-day Adventists is this three angels passage. If we were going to go back in our history, in fact, clear back to the very beginning, and notice what was present truth in at least three different ages of this Earth's history, we could find a convenient umbrella to do it under by the three apartments of the sanctuary. From uh, 4004 B.C. give or take 10,000 years excuse me for that I don't really mean that. From 4004 B.C. to the time of John the Baptist, Jesus' primary emphasis was in the court of the sanctuary. From the time of John the Baptist until 1844, the primary mission of Jesus is involved in the first apartment of the sanctuary. From 1844 until the end of the world, Jesus coming, the emphasis in the second part of the sanctuary. Mary Walsh, in her series of Bible studies in printed form, has uh, followed an interesting approach. She calls these three periods the three calls to the gospel feast and uh, uses the parable of Matthew 22 to demonstrate the point. The idea is that uh, during the first period of time, until John the Baptist, we have the breakfast menu. And the ingredients on the table for the gospel feast during breakfast are listed, and they include all of the great verities of the gospel. Then we come to the dinner setting of the table, and we find that there are some items left off of the dinner for the gospel feast. From the time of John the Baptist on, emphasis on the earthly sanctuary was dropped. That was one item of the menu left out. The significance of the ceremonial law and system was left out of the menu for dinner. And of course, the prophecies and looking forward to the first coming of Christ was left out of the menu for dinner. When dinner time came, from John the Baptist on, we have some new items for the menu that were added. Baptism, which displaced circumcision, The heavenly sanctuary, and of course Hebrews is pretty heavy on that, the Holy Spirit, as Christ's representative to the church, was added, 
in a unique sense, and the second coming of Christ, with some detail concerning that, came into focus. And these items, along with the original ones that were not dropped, continued on until supper time. Now, at supper time, around 1844, according to the prophetic time, there were several other items added to the menu of the gospel feast. One of them was the judgment, the investigative judgment. A second was the three angels and their message, all that it includes. And a third was the law and the Sabbath. Now, the law and the Sabbath were not new. In fact, they started way back at the beginning, but there had been a long period of dark ages when the truths involved there had been tramped in the dirt. So what's new since 1844? What else is new? Basically, the three angels' messages involving the investigative judgment and focus on God's Ten Commandments and the Sabbath. Now, um, I had thought of presenting something on the Sabbath in Hebrews 4 today, but decided we'd probably better bridge into the three angels' messages first. And that is uh, precisely what we'd like to do at this point. If there's ever a time in this earth's history when you need to understand why you are a Seventh-day Adventist, it's now. And the only unique thing which embraces the Sabbath, the law, and the judgment to Seventh-day Adventists is Revelation 14 on the three angels. That's the only thing we can ever claim to have been some sort of unique contribution to Christian thinking. Well, what do you think of when you think of the three angels' messages? My young friend or older friend, what do you think of? You think of the same thing that I thought of for so long? Well, let's see. The first one, the judgment. Oh, oh my. And the second one, get out of Babylon. And the third one, watch out for the Pope. I was thinking along those lines one day when I read something from an inspired pen that said, the third angel's message, embracing the message of the first and second angel, must be presented as the only hope for a perishing world. Now, just a minute. The only hope for a perishing world? The judgment is here. Get out of Babylon and watch out for the Pope. Does that sound like hope? Three, four years ago, I uh, presented some of these topics at the camp meeting here. I haven't done this in the church, but I'm interested in going into it now for the next few Sabbaths particularly in the light of the last two or three years of um, discussion concerning current issues. What are these three angels' messages? What are they really saying to us? As I began to look around and do a little research on it, I discovered something rather startling. There are but few even of those who claim to believe it, that comprehend the third angel's message. That was written in 1888. Not all of our ministers who are giving the third angel's message understand what constitutes that message. 5T715. That can keep a preacher awake at night. We talk about the first angel's message and the second angel's message, and we think we have some understanding of the third angel's message. But as long as we are content with a limited knowledge, we shall be disqualified to obtain clearer views of truth. There must be something clearer than perhaps we have understood.
You know, a while back, some of us became nervous because in the rising emphasis upon Jesus and faith and his finished work, there seemed to be a growing hostility toward the doctrines, the good old doctrines, the rusty old doctrines, as some said, of the church. And the impression began to rise that if you're going to be friendly toward Jesus and the cross, you've got to be unfriendly toward these rusty old doctrines. Well, this resulted in some feet bracing on the part of the gray beards who said, wait a minute. And they gave the impression that in order to be friendly toward the good old doctrines, you have to be unfriendly toward Jesus and the cross. And this dichotomy began to worry some people. It still does. How does Jesus and the cross and the great message of salvation through faith in him fit into these three angels' messages? The judgment, Babylon, and you know what? I'd like to suggest a new approach to Revelation 14, and I hope you've turned there by now. A new approach. We're used to the old prophetic and historical approach. We're used to pouring through dusty old bookstores and historical records to see how the whole thing fits together historically and prophetically. But wouldn't it be possible for us to have a new look experientially and see in Revelation something more than has happened in world affairs, but see in it something has happened in relationship of the individual to Jesus Christ. All right, uh, let's have a look at the first angel's message today for a starter. Found in Revelation, the 14th chapter, verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Please notice everlasting gospel. If you're going to take the position that the first angel's message is about the judgment, you're going to miss it by a mile. The first angel's message is not about the judgment. The judgment is not the first angel's message. Because the judgment has been relevant and pertinent only since 1844 for you students of prophecy. And that's far from everlasting. So if the first angel is talking about the everlasting gospel, it has to be something other than the judgment. And what would happen if you were to take the uh, judgment and Babylon and watch out for apostate church to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. There's something universal about these messages. If you were to go to some giant Muslim country and give them our usual historic and prophetic approach to the three angels' messages, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. But if you gave them the everlasting part of it, Chances are they might get the message. What is the everlasting part? Verse 7 tells you what the message is. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. In trying to get this together, I decided to diagram it. I uh, thought I'd gotten the victory over that when I left school, but uh, was vacuumed right into it. If we were to diagram verse 7, we'd find that it's a compound sentence made up of three parts. The first part, fear God. The second part, give glory to Him. The third part, worship Him. 
Well, where does for the hour of his judgment is come fit in? When I got to that part, I said, let's see, that's a preposition. I thought well, it must be a prepositional phrase. And I said so publicly. A book editor got a hold of me afterwards, and he said, uh, that's wrong. That's not a prepositional phrase. He said, that's an adverbial clause. And so I thanked him for the correction and uh, stated publicly in another place that this was an adverbial clause. A uh, English professor got me after that meeting, and he said, that's not an adverbial clause. That's a conjunctive phrase. And... Uh, so in order to be safe, I began calling it an adverbial, prepositional, adverbial, conjunctive phrase clause. <laughs> and then a Greek professor got a hold of me, and he said, that's a causal clause. Well, I don't know who's going to get a hold of me next on that, but the point is that for the hour of his judgment is come is secondary to the everlasting part of the first angel's message. In other words, the thing that makes it relevant for this time at the very end is that if there was ever a time when we needed to fear God, it's now in the time of the judgment. If there was ever a time when we needed to heed the everlasting, give glory to him, it's now during the time of the judgment. If there was ever a time that we needed to worship him instead of ourselves, it's now during the time of the judgment. Now, I'd like to propose to you, uh, just as a or divorce, that as we approach these three angels' messages, we notice a common thread that runs through all of them. And it is what sets it apart as the Elijah message, 1, 2, and 3. The common thread is a warning against self-worship and an invitation to the deeper life of dependence upon the Lord Jesus. That's it in a nutshell. Then let's proceed with the three parts and see how it works out in those three parts. First of all, fear God. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on that one. Uh, hopefully you've picked up by now even the younger generation. There's not talking about being afraid of God. Hymn number one in your hymnal has got to include A-W-E-F-U-L. It is holding God in awe, in reverence, in respect and is not running from him and cowering in his presence. Afraid to disappoint him. Afraid to let him down. Like I was afraid to disappoint my father or let him down. The second part, give glory to him. Give glory to him. Now we get into a little heavier aspect of the common thread. The truth is that there's no glory for mankind in the work of the gospel. Perhaps you've uh, read the phrase, which is a beautiful definition, Testimonies to Ministers 4, 5, 6. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God. And that much right there is heavy in itself. It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. That is very significant in the three angels' messages. No glory for man. Man is a creature. But the human problem the problem of all humanism is uh, to center in the glory, the achievements, the ability of man. In fact, I would like to propose to you that even if we get it straight, that we're not going to be able to add anything at all to the work of the cross. 
that we will still hold on like bulldogs to the idea that we can do something in the work that God wants to do in us. And many people, when they find that there is no way that they can weave themselves into the work, will reject the whole package. Whether it's in what God has done for us, or whether it's in what God wants to do in us, or whether it's what God wants to do with us, there is no glory for man in the work of the gospel, because we can do nothing except come to him and keep coming to him just as we are. Now the people in the days of Christ had a problem. They were glory hounds. They loved to blow the trumpet before them and recite long prayers and stand on the street corners with their scripture wrapped around their wrists and foreheads. The glory of man was up because the glory of God was down. There was a mother in the ancient history of Israel who was perceptive enough to name her child Ichabod when she realized the glory had departed from Israel. But in the days of Christ, even though the Shekinah had departed and had been gone for some time, they didn't seem to notice. And so the glory of man rose to the top. No wonder the Apostle Paul, the great champion of the Lord Jesus, said that even a little glorying is no good. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. I'd like to invite you, my friend, to join the angels above the plains of Judea who sang glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I'd like to invite you to join the Apostle Paul who said in Galatians 6, 14, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. We are to contemplate the character of Christ. We are to meditate upon the cross of Calvary, for it is the unanswerable argument of Christianity. The message we are to bear to the impenitent, the warning we are to give to the backslider, is, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Those who bring the message to the soul may turn aside from the truth, but he who would be saved must keep his eye on Jesus. By beholding Christ, he will learn to hate sin that has brought to his Redeemer suffering and death. By beholding, his faith is made strong, and he comes to know the only true God and Jesus Christ. The sinner sees Jesus as he is, full of compassion and tender love. And by beholding the manifestation of his great love toward fallen man in his sufferings on Calvary, he is transformed in character. That's pretty heavy. It is beholding Calvary that transforms us in character. Well, let's go to the last part and worship him. There are only two people to worship, either God or man. And we are born with the uh, insatiable desire to worship someone. That's why when God is not worshipped, Some man or woman rises to the top. If you don't worship God, you're going to worship Presley or Revolta or somebody. And whenever man worships man, whether it's another man or whether it's himself,
He is a victim of the problem of Baal worship, about which the warning in Revelation is so strong. But how feeble is man? As the psalmist says, we are like grass. We are like a vapor that soon fades away. I'd like to invite you to worship God, the Creator, instead of His creatures. We were crossing the Nile River several years ago, crossed from Luxor, which is on the site of ancient Thebes, the capital of Egypt in the days of Moses. We were going to the Valley of the Kings, where the glory had departed. And the kings had departed, and were now down in Cairo in glass-topped coffins in mummified form. As we reached the banks on the other side, having traveled in these weird-looking sailboats of the Nile, we saw an ancient monument to some great. It was toppled over in the dirt and the sand, half buried. And of course, Egypt is known for its obelisks and monuments. Ramses the Great, he, uh, he was apparently a great king, but he turned out, so they find now, to be one of the great chiselers. He took all the other kings' monuments and chiseled their names off and put his name on. But he's gone. And this statue in the sand inspired one of our group to begin quoting Shelley's Ozymandias. Now, I remember studying Ozymandias in literature class. Didn't like it too well. It seemed like poems should have rhyme and rhythm. To me, I realize it's a narrow view. Um, who was it? Uh, wrote Fog. Never have thought that Fog was a poem. But it struck a bell, Ozymandias. I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Nearby, half buried in the sand, a shattered visage lies whose curl lipped and sneer of cold command tell that the sculptor well those passions read which still survive carved in these lifeless things and on the pedestal these words appeared my name is Ozymandias king of kings look on my works ye mighty and despair nothing beside remains round the colossal wreck Boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, Zonk. Half buried in the sand. That's the way of man. And then uh, Everson comes along with his lines, We are living in a time when centuries are compressed into a few short years. Names of great men appear on the horizon, flicker for a moment, then are lost forever in the sea of forgetfulness. But there is one name that grows brighter with every passing day. It is the name of Jesus. Now, Jesus is our only hope. Jesus is our only salvation. Either from the guilt of sin, or the power of sin, or the presence of sin. There is nothing we can do but accept him. And Paul had something to say in this connection if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Romans 2.20, or 4.20, 
Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. The only person who gives glory and truly worships God is the person of faith. The one who has come to the realization that he cannot make it himself, that he cannot save himself, he cannot change himself. And that's why someday on that sea that looks like glass, a group of people are going to sing a song. And they're going to add something to that song. They're going to say, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Great and marvelous are thy works. God, save us from these ill-disguised glory sessions, even in the church, where we've discovered that we can keep people working by competition or pitting one person against another or one school against another or one class against another. God, save us from all of these ill-disguised glory sessions and help us to worship him, truly worship him. Jeremiah had it straight a long time ago when he said, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord. I'd like to invite you, my friend, to join me in our closing benediction. It comes from the Lord's Prayer. It's the last part that sometimes we leave off, but let's never. It starts with, Thine is the kingdom. Will you bow your heads and join me, please? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This has been another classic sermon from the Archive of American Christian Ministries. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls now 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. You can trust ACM. There is no compromise here. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. Peace coming soon. <laughs>